Okay, I, I think we can start again. Um, the figure you see on the screen, you've seen a couple of times already. And I won't actually talk about any of the physics that you're seeing there. What we're going to talk about is how do you make measurements and what do you measure, what kind of instruments. And uh, given there's only 40 minutes or so, I'm only going to concentrate on satellites. I'm not going to talk about all the ground-based uh, measurements we make as well. So another thing, it's Saturday afternoon, and as a professor, I've always wanted to give a lecture on a Saturday afternoon to a lively audience. Okay, So that's what you guys are. The next thing is, I'm actually a modeler and a kind of theorist. And how I've come to actually give a talk on the measurements and the instruments is uh, just a wee bit. Fortunately, there's John and a couple others who can correct me or keep me uh, kind of in 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 on track, let's say. Uh, I need to say thanks to Bill Lockco, Stan Solomon, and John Foster. Between the three of them, they've told you pretty much about the ITM world. They've told you about the thermosphere, uh, the ionosphere. This morning you did the lab and confusing as that was to many of you, uh, you kind of did open up Pandora's box and see how models aren't always perfect. So what we're going to do today is move into this kind of satellite world. And uh, I'll tell you that I'm going to talk about 113 satellites, billions of dollars worth of equipment up there that we in the ITM use. And I will say, NASA did not fund all of them. Mona, I'm going to point out one or two that NASA did. but. Uh, we've kind of, in our field, begged, borrowed, and stolen uh, like nothing. And that's kind of the takeaway message. How are we innovative enough to get this phenomenal uh, load of data that was never intended for us? Okay. So what we'll do is uh, I'll just say a little bit about myself, uh, Jan J. Soika. You heard this morning, uh, and Mona also mentioned, about the Mallard Space Science Laboratory in uh, England, part of University College London. That's where I uh, got educated. Uh, I got my PhD, and I flew rockets, uh, sounding rockets with real experiments on them for my PhD work. Then I left and came to the States and went to Logan, Utah, which is the same place as I am currently. And uh, I've worked as a modeler, uh, supercomputers, modeling the ionosphere, thermosphere. So the ITM is something that I kind of have worked in all my career. So let's uh, ask you. What does ITM stand for? Who says Meneosphere? You're wrong. It's <laughs> Mesosphere. Okay, so in this case, the M is Mesosphere. Okay, where does the Mesosphere lie relative to the thermosphere? Below. Okay, that's it. Good. All my questions today are easy, although cunning. Okay, Ionosphere, Thermosphere, Mesosphere. Okay. So uh, let's kind of start. These big volumes you've been saying are actually very, very important. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the details of uh, our ITM. I've told you about the three speakers who've talked in some detail already. But I do encourage you to realize uh, these volumes were heliophysics uh, from uh, start to finish, or from the sun to the, not quite the mud, but almost. And the ionosphere is well represented. Tim fuller Owl and Carl over here talked about the ionosphere and the chromosphere. Both have neutrals uh, in it uh, and ions. Uh, then we have a chapter on chrome mass ejections and atmospheric responses. Again, Tim and uh, Stan, more details. And there's two more chapters here, uh, terrestrial ionospheres. Uh, this week, uh, you heard Stan talk about a comparison between Venus, Mars, and our own ionosphere, thermosphere. And uh, I gave a talk uh, a few years back on the uh, long term, the climatology of how we got to where we are. Well, most of you may have this book already, but uh, in terms of if you are interested in the ionosphere, you're a graduate student, young postdoc, this is pretty much a kind of Bible type textbook. OK, so that's kind of the background. Everything I show you, if it's a nice graphic, it's from Google. I just Googled the heck out of it, OK? At the end, I've got a page with uh, kind of acknowledgments as to where I found them all. OK, so let's start. The thermosphere. These, this you've seen before, but there is a reason for showing it in a particular way. So we've got the thermosphere. Uh, you're familiar now with this density scale. 
to confuse you, it's in centimeters cubed rather than meters cubed, but uh, it's up to 10 to 10, 10 to the 11th down at 120 kilometers. And then we go up through what was going to be the ionosphere. OK, so that's our neutrals, as we'll see in a second. And over here, I'll put the ionosphere. Now, these are from two different sources, but they're scaled approximately across. Not exactly, but as near as I can make it. I have a question for you in a second. But now you should all be familiar. Uh, this is the, which layer is this called? F2. And what about this one? E. It's from this particular source, you'd almost argue they've mislabeled it, and they have. But this is now what we're familiar with. The light ions are higher up, and that's all normal. Uh, so let's go on. Uh, neutral species are uh, ionized species. And what I want to do is ask you this question. Where or what is Leo? What's Leo? OK, and uh, Leo, where is it? 800, any more? 300? OK, we've just, this, this is a reasonable representation of Leo. Why don't I bring Leo down to 200? Uh, OK, so we're, we're going to talk about that. There's reasons for getting closer to the Earth, depending on your mission objectives. OK, but this is the, you know, the ballpark. And you, as you can see, the ITM world really does uh, lie in Leo. So it's a, a fairly neat kind of correlation, if you like. Low Earth orbit. Uh, the other important parameter is 90 minutes. You've heard about substorms and other phenomena that uh, ramp up in minutes, tens of minutes, take three hours overall. A satellite doing once every 90 minutes is too slow to catch. Uh, all of the dynamics you've already heard about in the magnetosphere and the ionosphere. OK, a little bit more. OK, so our ITM system is a driven system, by and large. Uh, we've not talked about this this week here, but there's tides and gravity waves from below. And they do introduce a perturbation uh, into our system. And it's quite measurable. Uh, from above are, are the ones that we've uh, brought into context in various uh, ways to this week. The auroral precipitation, we're all familiar with that. Dual dissipation, uh, pointing flux, uh, frictional heating. There's a number of terms that aren't quite synonymous, but cover how energy comes from this thing we call the magnetosphere. Uh, the plasmaspheric downflow, John most certainly touched upon the dynamics of the plasmasphere, these large density regions uh, during big storms coming down. Uh, starlight and scattered radiation, what does that do for us? Ionizes the night. So this is our nighttime maintenance. Up here was the solar EUV. Sorry, I missed it. Uh, it's our primary ionization source uh, for the day side. And as we get to the lower, uh, lower down into the D region uh, mesosphere, we start worrying about uh, much uh, harder radiation, if you like, more energetic particles. And although no one's talked about it, meteors, uh, when they ablate in the upper atmosphere, they leave uh, metal ions. And in the E region, there's all kinds of interesting phenomena uh, in the mesosphere, thermosphere as well, of what these ions uh, and neutrals do. OK, so that's the kind of drivers that we need to worry about. So part of our measurements will be that. I'm just going to have two scenarios, two questions, one for the thermosphere and one for the ionosphere, to set off what kind of measurements we would like to do. So this first one, the question is, and it's really important today, there's a MURI just been announced to try to tackle this. How does the thermospheric density respond to specific scale sizes and durations of energy deposition processes? You've heard how the aurora, and almost any uh, parameter you measure in the magnetosphere, it's highly variable in time. Very rarely are the steady stationary. This, though, the people do really care about this. Uh, Harry Warren showed a movie of thousands of things moving around, and one of them collided with another. Okay? But in general, they don't, because people try really hard to track them and avoid collisions. So that's kind of what, one of the reasons why we want to make measurements in this environment and understand it. The other one uh, is a little bit more tricky in its uh, consequences. We have lots of good models, and the one you've used is a good one. It's not a great one. Uh, but in the ionosphere, there are phenomena on all sorts of other scale sizes, much smaller than what you've been looking at, down to meters, literally. And they cause havoc 
in uh, communication systems, even with GPS communication systems. So uh, this uh, understanding these instabilities, and again, how the energy flows from large scales down to small scales, or goes the other way, is, is a big deal in the ionosphere. Because uh, from a who cares radio wave propagation, from a VLF all the way up to the GPS L-band, is really important to a wide range of people. The simple HF uh, kind of communication systems, first responders, whenever there's a, a worldwide emergency, uh, earthquake, hurricanes, you name it, uh, the, the uh, ham radio people are often the only ones who can immediately get up and have communications going at HF frequencies. So again, the ionosphere comes in. What do we need to measure in the ITM? So this is just a, a general question. Throw out some ideas. What should we measure? What parameter might we want to measure? De electron density. Temperatures. Species. Neutral wind, yes. Velocity of the ions uh, that gives you electric fields, uh, things like that. OK, we, we're all on the same page. So you want to measure all of these things, OK? So let's just see what the answer is. So the state variables are your parameters you've been mentioning, uh, dynamics. And what's really important and really hard to do is multi-point, simultaneous, uh, along with ITM drivers. So it's basically everything all the time. That's in the state of our understanding, the fundamental physics we think we have, but it's an inhomogeneous, time-evolving system. You can't get all the boundary conditions and just let the thing run. You need uh, almost from an assimilation like weather models, tropospheric weather models, or oceanography models. You need data as well. Uh, OK, so that's kind of, we're now into Star Wars. OK, how many of you recognize this from a movie? OK, it's, and I'm lying, of course. It's a real satellite. Uh, uh, it's a smaller satellite. It's not the big satellites, but uh, it's a satellite called CHAMP. Okay? And we're starting with the thermosphere. How do you measure thermospheric density? Okay? So uh, it had a mission that lasted uh, 10 years. Uh, 460 kilometers high enough it would last that long. And it's followed by GRACE. Uh, these satellites, this says gravity recovery and climate experiment. Gravity recovery, what do you think that refers to? Pardon? No, uh, it's funded. This one, uh, this, it's not pictured here, but it's very similar to this one. GRACE was actually designed to look for small-scale changes in uh, gravitational masses. Uh, OK, so the Earth's not a homogeneous ball either. Yeah. Uh, OK, so did we all get that? So that if, I'm presuming the gravitational effect on the two for any gradients uh, moves them around, and then you determine that separation. OK, so that My being. Uh, larger than a cube satellite, but smaller than an observatory. Uh, okay, it's, it's kind of like there's the oceans and things. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, but the point I'm going to make here is as we do these missions, their main objective of uh, great grace is, is nothing to do with our field. Okay, but in order to do this right, grace, just like CHAMP, had to know what the uh, thermospheric density was, see what the drag was. So how do you measure thermospheric density? So this is the first of our useful conversations. What does the thermospheric density do to the satellite? Slow it down, and that's a deacceleration. So how, what kind of instrument would you use to measure deacceleration? Accelerometer. So it's nothing to do with particles. There's no mass spectrometers. These have been flown, but they're huge instruments and very difficult to make work properly. We're talking about uh, simple things like an accelerometer. And these are tiny little things, potentially. Uh, you put three together and get the vector uh, acceleration. Okay, so, so here's our first kind of lead in to uh, innovation. 
uh, the accelerometers were needed by all these other people for their missions. And of course, uh, we then use it to, oh, by the way, you now know the drag, and we can work backwards to get to our densities. Now, it's not a particular species. It's the, uh, what you might call, the mean density uh, of the environment they've gone through. OK, so that's kind of how I'm going to do most of this. Uh, what do you think this is? It's South America. Good. What's this? Falkland Islands. Falkland Islands. Thank you. OK, so what, what do you think we're plotting here? OK, fair enough. And no, it's the other way around. It's a re-entry vehicle. And the re-entry we're talking about here is what happens when you make measurements at lower heights? In order to do things uh, well relative to the Earth, if that's what you're interested in, you want to be low. So the problem with these things is short lifetime. How do you make the lifetime of a satellite longer if you're low down? You put power on board. Okay? You, you, you have some fuel. So this one, again, uh, it's called Goshi. Again, it's a gravity field uh, experiment. But to do that well, you want to be lower than uh, you know, higher uh, to be sensitive to the Earth's uh, geo uh, crust. Okay? So they actually flew this one at 250. Now remember where our LEO kind of bottom line was, 300-ish? This thing is taking a big risk. Uh, it's two or three E foldings deeper into the atmosphere. The drag is quite large on this. Normally, you don't expect this to last a few months. But with power, they were able to make the mission last four years. So again, uh, the accelerometers were totally necessary to determine where actually was it at any given time. Uh, then uh, this picture I just pulled off the web. It's a little ugly, but the reason I'm showing it is uh, a, a xenon tank and a, ni a nitrogen tank. And it's an iron thruster uh, technology that kept this thing uh, stable uh, in orbit for so long. But again, nothing to do with ITM. But the output from these magnetometers, once again, at these low altitudes, we would never get NASA to pay for us to build something we're going to throw away in three or four months uh, by flying underneath the uh, F layer. Okay? So innovation. Uh, we're not quite finished with this design yet. Okay? Uh, this is currently up uh, It's an ESA mission called SWARM. And I don't think there's an acronym for it. I, I think this is one of the few missions where the name SWARM is exactly what it's supposed to uh, tell you about. Uh, this SWARM mission, again, uh, is designed uh, for uh, ITM physics this time. It measures our large number of our normal parameters, densities, uh, temperatures, uh, the ion drift velocity, electric fields. This is designed for our field, if you like. But there's three satellites, as you can see. And my question to you is, why in different orbit planes? Why would you go and put them in different orbit planes? The gradients. And, and this is. Uh, there's the gradients, of course, in line uh, that you're in the one orbit. But the other set of gradients are equally important, depending on your orbits, is the ones perpendicular to that. And engineering-wise and energy-wise, it's very difficult to have uh, missions uh, deploy into separate orbital planes. Uh, the energy to change your primary orbit uh, is large. But that's what they've done here. So they measure horizontal gradients. OK, this is a, a really cute, uh, you know, well-used ITM NASA mission. It's called TIME, Thermospheric, Atmospheric, Mesospheric. There's your TIM, Energetic Dynamics. And this one uh, is kind of special in that uh, it explored the ignorosphere. When this was built uh, way back before 2000, there's a region between about 60 kilometers and 90 kilometers where Apart from a rocket briefly flying through, you couldn't get to. Balloons couldn't get up there, and no one dared come down the other way with satellites. So uh, re remote sensing is the other big tool that our field uses. So on this, we have uh, optical sensors that look at different wavelength bands, uh, specific wavelengths that are emissions from particular species. And with good spectroscopy, you can tell the temperature, of course, from Doppler effect the motion. But densities and temperatures of species. And uh, SABRE has been around for this 10 years and has been a real uh, major supplier of data 
on what's going on in the ignorosphere. In fact, we'd never use the word anymore with a mission like this and another mission called AIM that's just come along. We know so much about it. Uh, Guvi, another instrument, C, okay. This one, these are all pointing earthwards, and this one points out towards the sun. And we've talked about it. Who talked about the C instrument this week? Harry Warren, uh, in his talk about the solar irradiance, uh, we had uh, this instrument. When did you get to play with C data? Yeah, how many of you remember being in a lab that used C timed data? Hands up, please, both of you. <laughs> okay, okay, come on guys, it's Saturday afternoon. Anyway, this one looks out to the sun and these look down into the earth but they're spectrometers, uh, optical devices. Uh, the trouble with uh, looking at the sun maybe isn't uh, the same problem. It's almost like a disk that's emitting that we can integrate over. But looking the other way, we would like to actually resolve in a particular location what the temperature and density is or the drift velocity. Spectrometers are integrating. They're a line of sight. So you're looking through a column. And uh, the mathematics of inverting these is, is quite challenging. So there's a great career in math, if you like, and how you uh, deconvolute these uh, observations. OK. This one is my own personal favorite, SDO. Uh, it's been talked about again. Uh, here it is. It's a cute little satellite. There's only, four, there's only three instruments on it, EVE, HMI, and AIA. OK. It's so uh, Harry talked at some length about. Who did that to me? I don't know about these things. It's not possible, is it? They're not going to go away. Quit. Where's my quit button? Upper left. Um, go away. OK, so ah, we're back. Thank you. OK, so here we are. Uh, solar irradiance, as we've all talked about over the last few days, is the critical creation of our ionosphere. And measuring that, we're not complete yet. We still have parts of that spectrum to do properly. But nonetheless, the current mission, EVE, uh, this instrument here, every 10 seconds, we can actually get that solar irradiance. And since it's, uh, OK, that's the question. How large is it? How large is this small satellite? <laughs> It's a ginormous. It's an observatory. Uh, we think there's only three instruments on it, and it's uh, so. So these are humans. These aren't robots. These are real <laughs> humans. Uh, and this is it here. This is the solar cells you saw in the other picture, one on each side, and they test up four telescopes you saw. This is an, a, a true observatory. Uh, the Eve, inst Eve, Eve is down here, I believe, uh, on one of these sides down at the bottom. Okay, so we kind of take data from anybody who's willing to fly it for us. Uh, and this has been an awesome success. OK. So 10. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, 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 con I'm con yeah, I wish to contrast a billion dollars with CubeSats eventually. OK. How much was it, Carl? <laughs> Why is it in geosynchronous orbit? They can view the sun almost continuously, but that's not the best reason. Yes, sir. Uh, and there are ginormous data requirements. And uh, being in geosync, it means one ground station 24 7 is listening to it uh, or collecting data. I think it's a one-way transfer. <laughs> it's, it's just a, yeah, one station downlink 24-7. Uh, MMS, as you heard today, well, maybe not quite. You'll hear maybe in a day or two. MMS has these four huge satellites with phenomenally 100 instruments, as you heard, all taking data at a phenomenal rate. And it's not geosync. So it's downlink. Uh, I don't know how to do it. Yeah. OK, let's continue. 
<laughs> okay. So just a little bit more, coming back to energy. If you can measure temperatures, you, can, you get your best uh, indicator of what the energy is doing to the thermosphere and ionosphere. So to some extent, uh, we come back to temperature. In what we've been talking about, even in the uh, lab, there's this thing called the pressure level and the altitude. So one last time, uh, solar minimum, solar maximum. Uh, Tn is much hotter in solar maximum, solar minimum, as you've heard all along. And that's the case uh, up here in what you'd call the uh, ionosphere proper, or the thermosphere. Down here in the mesosphere, there's a small change between solar min and solar max, but this is a huge thermal reservoir, and it's pretty hard for the solar cycle EUV part to change its temperature significantly. But up here, where the densities are lower, not low, but lower, um, well certainly you get this large factor of change. And this is uh, just looking at daylight sunlight. So in aurora and other things, these temperatures move around as well quite a bit. So measuring temperature, if there's a way of doing it, would be really good. Uh, what are the primary energy sources? And so that's what we're going to talk about now for a second or two. Just what is it we're trying to uh, actually learn about? Well, the solar EUV was, uh, to some extent, from the uh, sun side, what Harry talked about. Photo dissociation, uh, photo ionization, and more importantly, the energetic photoelectrons are energetic enough to create other ionizations. And that's a problem if you don't know the spectrum properly or very well. So that's one of the big areas we still have to kind of worry about and get right. But this is kind of the solar photon input. And then, of course, uh, there's other signatures that we get, air glow, so that uh, one can look at emissions coming back from these neutrals that have been heated up and are now coming back in the ground state uh, and learn about them. Uh, then this, uh, these uh, energetic uh, electrons, which carry most of the f electrons away from the photons, uh, cause all kinds of heating. Well, certainly the electron gas heats rapidly, but there's ion heating. And of course, all of this through collisions lead to the neutral gas heating. So the models, and the one that we played with this morning, doesn't necessarily have this full uh, feedback. But the modern day models do tend to take the driver and come all the way through to coupling all of these things appropriately. Then the other energy source, and the, the big one you've seen uh, from Mona, uh, images of the aurora. Uh, the aurora then visually gives you about 20% of the magnetospheric energy channel. The other 80% comes from electromagnetic energy. We, we kind of have contour plots of the potential distribution, which is associated with an electric field distribution, which is generated uh, in the kind of magnetosphere solar wind, as you've heard about. But we're kind of the bottom of the food chain, but we get the energy eventually. And uh, this kind of number can be larger than the day side, the entire day side illumination from the sun. And I didn't mean to have any equations here, so ignore these. But basically, dual heating and uh, the kinetic energy of uh, the, the electromagnetic radiation through ion drag. So there's momentum and energy that uh, is transferred to the neutral gas. So that's kind of what we would like to know more about. So coming once again to how do we get our data? What data do we get? So the DMSP fleet is a uh, Department of Defense fleet. They are the weather uh, satellites for the DOD. And they've been up for about 30 plus years. And they keep the fleet current. And there's usually two operating ones. They're at 800 kilometers. They're sun synchronous, uh, which means to stay in the same local time plane. And uh, this fleet has on board a suite of instruments. Okay, And these are really important. They're a plasma, all the plasma parameters we can think of, magnetic field measurements, uh, which gets you to the currents. Uh, auroral particles, uh, all of the above. The ion velocities lead us to electric fields. So this is the ideal kind of zeroth order ITM uh, plasma suite of measurements. And they're put on all of these missions. And uh, these environmental instruments provide the main ITM measurements. But we're flown as a satellite health package. The DOD had no interest in us in our science when these packages were created. What they're designed to do is monitor the environment of the satellite. If for any reason a military satellite stops working, the military are more than interested to know why it stopped working. 
and there's usually more than one reason, and so they really want to know why. But as a consequence, we have we've inherited, we've pirated this data. In fact, even more exciting was this. Oops. It's a lousy photograph, but this is an early photograph, uh, and I've stolen it from an appropriate DOD website. What's this thing here? It's the aurora. This is long before we scientists had the, the uh, capability to make the auroral measurements from space. The DMSB satellite, as it crosses uh, the, co the continents, uh, makes measurements uh, to look at cloud cover and other things. And uh, in this particular example, it's nighttime. What, what coast are we following up here? Yeah, uh, this is the, the kind of uh, Washington, New York, Boston kind of seafront, if you like. What's this down here? Yeah, and it, it's missing John Foster's plume. It's, it's not on this, right? But it, uh, these are the aurora. And there was a huge battle between uh, Shin Akatsufu uh, and the DOD to get these publicly released. For years, the DOD had all of these scientifically useful images, and uh, they weren't released, and Shin uh, battled it uh, to get them released. And these were our first real images of what did the aurora instantaneous, well, it's not instantaneous. As it flies across here, it scans across like this and, and builds this up in a raster form. But that was kind of where we started. And nowadays, uh, we get our aurora from the uh, International Space Station. Uh, I show this. Uh, most of these images are just taken by an astronaut on his own camera or her own camera. So the other source of uh, imagery, again, isn't professional in the ITM sense. But you can see uh, the aurora. This one shows the limb of the Earth. So we're further away, nighttime, of course, here. But this one actually shows the other part of the uh, auroral structures. It's not just this thin layer. It's actually rays of, uh, as, the electro as the electrons come in with different energies, they ionize at different heights. And in so doing, uh, the recombination leads to emissions from different heights. And at the higher altitudes, uh, the color is different. Why do you think the color is different? Different species that you're ionizing and recombining. So again, that's great. And over here is something even more useful to you. ISS, 9.41 this evening, for about three minutes, 55 degree elevation, southwest, magnitude minus three. Now, magnitude of minus three, we should all see it with your eyeball. So if the sky is clear, you should be able to see the International Space Station uh, to the southwest. 55 degree elevation should take you above the mountains. Uh, OK, that was an aside. Uh, lunchtime the, uh, conversation brought that up. OK. How do I move it over? OK, so what we've got here is the other extreme. The DMSB satellites are somewhat similar to the uh, SDO satellite. They're, they're, they're ginormous uh, instruments uh, costing, let's just say, millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars. This is a pair of CubeSats, one there and one there, called uh, the Dynamic Ionospheric CubeSat Explorer DICE. It was launched 2001. And they, they are in low Earth orbit, but they've re-entered already. Uh, their lifetimes are pretty short. But this object is only 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 15 centimeters. So this is the next kind of generation of ITM kind of sensors. Uh, there's all the normal uh, instruments on here, electric field, magnetometers, Langmuir probes. What does a Langmuir probe measure? Electron density and electron temperature. Uh -huh. You can recover both. So that's what these are doing. Uh, but in actual fact, we don't want one or two. We want hundreds. Coming back to our space-time problem that we face. And uh, this is kind of a prototype one. Some of the instruments worked. Not everything was perfect. Uh, I have to complain to the, the person who drew this. Uh, on this axis, it's got thermosphere, mesosphere, stratosphere, and troposphere of reasonable. Look at the density profile. This is saying this is the ionosphere. What's wrong with it? Yeah, from everything we've seen, it's the wrong way around. Density is going this way. OK, sorry. It's just. It took me ages to figure out why that wiggly line was there. 
How many have used? Yes, sir. Okay, so, so the question really is a good one uh, from an engineering point of view. Uh, on a, a NOAA GOES satellite or any of the big commercial satellites, there's an infinitely many electrical circuits uh, carrying current all over the satellite with different cadences. So there is almost no way you could a priori or in real time know which currents are flowing. But for a small satellite with a very dedicated uh, current usage, if you like, you can figure out and compensate for uh, the nearness of your magnetometer to these other uh, fields. In fact, surface-mounted magnetometers are possible uh, under special conditions too. But they have to be very much uh, a, a magnetometer-sensitive kind of mission. Yeah? But you're right. that Normally, you put a magnetometer on a long boom. Yeah? How many of you use this on a daily basis? What is it? GPS, okay? Now, we didn't pay a single penny for this, and yet this is our bread and butter uh, to a large extent. Okay, GPS, global positioning satellites. How many are there in this initial fleet? Uh, 28 plus spares, uh, yeah? And the next generation is being prepared. And the Europeans have a generation. What's the European uh, geosync ones called? Galileo. And then the uh, Chinese the Russians, so there's a whole bunch of fleets. And all of them operate in a way that we can get GPS data. And uh, our field is just booming thanks to all of these other people. OK, how GPS works? Well, you need a tractor. <laughs> <laughs> OK, or you need a better view graph. OK. So what we're going to do is just talk about this a little. It's, it's our bread and butter. It's worthwhile you all understanding how simple it is, but yet uh, the physics behind it. So it's a, quick it's a quick discussion. Five points I'm making, and then the sixth one is the kind of main part of the story. The, the geolocation of a ground-based radio receiver, and that's what we're putting on tractors or whatever, depends upon obtaining several, not one, you need many different direction, accurate line of sight distance and angle measurements. So if you know the reference point and how far you are from it and the angle, and you take that from several directions, you can do the algorithm. So that what you need is uh, that to your, from, the, from several of the GPS satellites. And that's easy to do in principle. But the trouble is, each of these line of sight distances involves a radio wave propagating through a refractive material. And this is the ionosphere. And a refractive material, like light and glass, you get refraction, uh, phase changes from what you expected. Uh, and uh, time delays. Anyway, uh, uh, time of flight uh, nor the signal phase are simply dependent on distance. It's what it went through, uh, the angle it went through versus vertical. All of these give you different uh, corrections. Hence, corrections need to be made for the ionosphere. The corrections are for time of flight, phase, and refraction. Refraction just means bending. It's not quite in the direction you thought. Uh, GPS uses two different uh, frequencies. Each has a different correction. So as it's like with light, uh, red light versus blue light, a prism. You get different amounts of refraction uh, for the different colors. It's the same here. Future GPS is going to use three frequencies to almost make it absolute that you don't need to correct for the ionosphere. But for the time being, we do. And uh, there's great effort done to make this correction. So the correction's made. And the correction involves knowing how many electrons are along each path. That's a slant path. And that's this word TEC you hear over and over again. And uh, TEC is the GPS user's noise and the ITM science measurement. And we get them for free from all over the world. Okay? And uh, our models, our assimilation models that we start starting to develop for the ionosphere depend uh, on this data set. Now, GPS then can be used again in a more innovative way. This one is the cosmic constellation, uh, which has uh, six satellites. And they're going to do a thing called a radio occultation. What's a radio occultation? Anybody familiar with this technique? OK. 
Kind of. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it for a second. Yes, a couple of you. Okay, again, it's using refraction, but refraction in a more uh, innovative way. Uh, this is a GPS satellite, and this is the orbit of cosmic. So this is one cosmic satellite at three different times. Okay, as you come around uh, initially, you're kind of above the ionosphere. So from you to the satellite, there's a small amount of uh, uh, density, the plasma sphere, uh, the magnetosphere, but it's a relatively small amount. But as you propagate uh, around your orbit, you're going to go into shadow eventually. But before you go into shadow, you're going you're to have rays that are passing through the layer. And uh, there is a mathematical technique that one can use to recover what you might call, if this was a very homogeneous uh, layer, you can recover the altitude profile. And this is the kind of first time we're getting really good feel for the electron density profile. Where is the peak uh, in the F layer? Uh, what height is it? Uh, what's its density? So th these are uh, phenomenal satellites, too, using our GPS system in a different way. OK, so there is a, it provides us the electron density profile. Uh, yeah, one more freebie. Uh, most of us have come to learn how to find ways of innovatively getting freebie stuff. Ampere, Active Magnetosphere and Planetary Electrodynamics Response Experiment. The title is pretty irrelevant, apart from the word magnet in there, and we'll, we'll explain it. Uh, Iridium 66. What's Iridium 66? Is it a US highway? No. Uh, these dots. Uh, on this sphere represent the 66 satellites that form a low Earth orbit communication system. Any point on the Earth can send a signal upwards, uh, be picked up by any one of these satellites, and instantaneously, well, it's not quite true, seconds are involved, uh, communicate that information to any other point on the Earth and downlink it to the receiver. So this is, uh, you could be in the oceans, you can be everywhere, uh, anywhere. And uh, the data then gets packaged in different ways. But this is the principle of what you'd call uh, the Iridium satellite communication system. But each satellite needs to know where it is. So which non-science grade housekeeping instrument is used for this thing here? Anybody want to guess which instrument we're using? Mm -hmm. So this comes back to the, your earlier question about magnetometers. Normally, your magnetometer is kept far away. But if you're, a, you're just using a dirty old magnetometer uh, just to tell you whether the, the Earth's magnetic field is up this way and you're down this way, these are just called attitude magnetometers. And in general, they're not very useful to us scientists. However, if uh, you have geomagnetic disturbances, and especially the larger ones, the extra current becomes a little bit of noise on these magnetometers. So most people would never, ever dream of flying them as a science instrument. But if you've got 66 continually telling you what kind of blips have we got, you can do things. And that's what the innovation here is. Oops, uh, magnetometer, we've done that. OK, on the left panel, you see these slices. These represent the orbit planes, the 11 orbit planes that the uh, satellites are in. And it's a two-hour uh, kind of, not so much an integration, just all the data of these uh, disturbances from the normal Earth's magnetic field are drawn on here. And you can see some uh, are going one way, some are going the other way. And we've got currents which are going up and down. Remember region one, region two currents that we, we heard about? That's what this is uh, kind of showing us. And this is what you call the data that came down from these uh, attitude magnetometers, which individually aren't particularly useful to people. But in this collection, uh, you can process it into what we call our, uh, uh, basically, Ampere's law was used. And you recover, if you like, region two on the outside, region one on the inside. And all the little uh, flows are coming up and down from discrete structures between the ionosphere and the magnetosphere. So again, this, this is a, a, a two-hour integration. So things are happening, remember, pretty fast. But nonetheless, 
for the first time we're getting global, not quite snapshots, but almost, of a parameter we almost didn't pay anything for. In actual fact, the National Science Foundation had to give the PI a little bit of money to actually buy the data from uh, the kind of uh, iridium providers. No, that's okay because that they have at any given time about 10 to 12 lying as spares, uh, in each one in each orbit plane. So they can move things around. And you know, you're right. Uh, the original was to put uh, 77 up, but the 66 are the effective constellation that works. What happened to one of these iridium dead satellites? It crashed. You know, Harry Warren's picture and the collision. That was one of the iridiums. Uh, well, we shouldn't worry about it too much today. OK, our next little uh, problem is, uh, OK, this picture you're all bored with now. This is our eastward electric field. Here's our equatorial magnetic field. And plasma is pushed up here in the day side. It falls down the sides, producing the Appleton anomalies, Appleton crests, OK? So of course, one needs to study this. But the real reason for studying it is when you come past dusk, the uh, lower side of the ionosphere gets eroded away because of recombination. And that very steep gradient is in the opposite direction to the gravity, and instabilities grow there. And we get phenomena called bubbles. And these bubbles cause havoc with GPS signals and any other kind of radio signals that we're currently using. So understanding the bubbles is important. So the DOD has this scene of satellite. Uh, it's it's kind of up there just now. Uh, it's relatively uh, high originally, but it's circularized. Uh, it's come down, and it's about to re-enter this fall. But this is a, a proper science ITM satellite. It's got a whole host of uh, onboard uh, instruments, the uh, electric field measurement, the long booms, uh, a, measure, a measurement device to actually look at the ions and neutrals, the temperatures. Uh, there's uh, an occultation receiver, just like the cosmic. Uh, it's also doing the same thing. Uh, a digital ion drift meter. Uh, this is kind of an alternative way of measuring electric fields. They, they have both pros and cons. Uh, there's a, another tomography experiment sending out two other uh, frequency emissions that you can pick up on the ground and do tomography to figure out what the ionospheric structure looks like as the satellite passes over, overhead. And of course, Langmuir type probes. Okay, so that's the uh, kind of mission. What's really neat about it is it's now about to re enter. So, with this, it's, it's very rare for us to have an instrument fully functioning still with all of the ITM science measurements on board. And somewhere in November, and I put quotes around it. Because they're within the, the community of uh, PIs and COIs, there's a kind of little pool uh, to figure out which day and which hour is this going to re-enter. Our, our knowledge of drag, especially in this lower region, is so poor, we're not real sure when it's going to be. The word November is about as good as we've currently got. And if the sun flares up a little bit, uh, it changes to move towards October. If it really got quieter, it moves towards December. Anyway, uh, that's just going down below LEO. You run into this problem. OK. OK, so I'm getting close to the end. We've heard about 108 satellites so far in all of these constellations. We've paid for very few. But the next few uh, are proper NASA, NSF, and uh, other agency missions to do ITM science. Uh, this one, 2017, so it's pretty close. It's a LEO orbit. And again, it's a full ITM mission. It's, it's got a Michelson interferometer. This time, they're going to try to look at neutral winds and temperatures. It's been a real hard thing to measure the, the Doppler in the uh, uh, thermosphere. Uh, we've measured things lower down in the mesosphere. But this measurement. Uh, is kind of, it's not the first ever, but we're hoping it will get done properly and we'll get p wind patterns in the thermosphere. Okay, uh, then of course we uh, use the EUV in the far ultraviolet, extreme and far, 
uh, to look at different emissions in the, both the neutrals and the ions. And that tells you, uh, again, it's a line of sight, unfortunately. But nonetheless, uh, we deconvoluted carefully. You can get information about various species, uh, specific species, uh, both day and night, and uh, their temperature distribution. And of course, from a driver point of view, uh, and the ionospheric point of view will fly the electric field measurements as well as the in-situ plasma. But we come back to this old problem. It's one satellite, and it goes around once every 90 minutes. And uh, lots of activity that we're interested in, variability, happens much quicker than every 90 minutes. So this one, its great objective is to make this work. Can we actually measure the wind field? Uh, and it's a, a real important driver, if you like. Couple more, gold. Uh, this again, it's a, a higher resolution ultraviolet imaging spectrometer, but it's going to be a geosynchronous satellite. It's going to sit and stare at the Earth, uh, the entire Earth, continuously, and it will be programmable, so you can go in with very high resolution and look at Washington D.C. Although probably no reason for it there, but you can actually focus on different parts of the uh, atmosphere and watch its evolution. So during an auroral disturbance, you can watch a particular volume of the thermosphere and watch how energy uh, waves flowing through it and modulate and change it. So again, uh, fairly innovative. Uh, it's on a commercial satellite because it's believed to be cheap and cheerful to put it on someone else and let them take the, uh, OK. Cosmic 2 is coming because Cosmic 1 was a, a remarkable success. I talked about us learning about the EDP. But for the first time ever from satellites, they were able to look at the water content in the troposphere. So the water content in the troposphere is way more important to humanity than the EDPs. Okay? And a lot of the cosmic series are funded by other scientists interested through this occultation on making regular measurements. The other way of measuring this was through radio sondes launching balloons with radio sondes every few hours all over the world. So a cosmic fleet with the GPS fleets and all of the new GPS satellites make this a really attractive way of mapping the troposphere's water content. Um, Opal, uh, this is a, a 3U CubeSat. So we're going in our kind of missions from the extremely small to the extremely large. And in every case, these new CubeSats are testing what, what kind of instruments can you make small enough to make measurements for the ITM population, if you like, that are reasonable? One thought to take away is these super huge instruments on the big satellites, they have maybe three or four orders of magnitude sensitivity. Now, for space weather and for a lot of our studies, we want to know when there's a big storm, when the electric field's large, when the fluxes are very large, how large are they? We're not worried about the three orders of magnitude smaller fluctuations. Now, we should as scientists, but in terms of uh, CubeSats, have many of them up there, you have a different philosophy. You're not going to measure everything. And a lot of the stuff that's going on is just noise uh, because you don't have the sensitivity. But if you tune your instrument to, let's say, an, a dynamic range that's the big stuff, that's kind of where uh, the philosophy has to go. If you want to capture three orders of magnitude with 3U, you're kind of pushing your luck. Uh, and technologies are evolving, but I, I'd be impressed if they ever get there. OK, so I got 112, if you were counting. But uh, there's all of these other ones. I mean, I didn't even uh, mention uh, uh, radiation belt storm probes, AIM. This is the one that looks at noctilucent clouds and things. Uh, EPOP, a Canadian one looking at the polar wind that we didn't talk about. The NOAA goes uh, in terms of monitoring uh, both the, the X-rays and whatnot. How many of you have used NOAA goes X-rays as a measure of uh, solar flares and things? OK, a few of you have. Uh, I didn't even mention it. Uh, In-orbit spares. You know, there, there's these commercial entities have not just the 66 satellites, but a whole bunch more waiting to be used so that the uh, longevity of our missions is there. Uh, new GPS fleets from other countries. So have I missed anybody's favorite satellite? Yes. You 
Tell me the name of it. Uh, uh, no, it's called Wrecked. No, it's not Wrecked. Wrecked is the instrument of storm radiation Van Allen belt. Um, it's got this ridiculous name. Reptile. Re it's yeah. It's it's called the, the the Colorado Space Weather something something. I mean, why it didn't let the students come up with the acronym? I don't know. Uh huh. Okay, I apologize. <laughs> Okay, I've got three going away. I've got just a couple of messages. The ITM space is also the LEO. And this has the unique advantages since other disciplines and services need their spacecraft in our piece of heliosphere. So it's a, a common overlap. And being nice, friendly with other people actually has led to phenomenal success for us. ITM scientists have learned how to partner and leverage with others acquire observations very cost effectively. Uh, ITM scientists have learned to be creative and innovative when it comes to getting science measurements. Beg, borrow, steal. That's what we teach our undergraduates. And, you know, so it's kind of something that we've taken away. OK, I'm ready to start my next hour. Uh -huh. Well, I'm not getting a very positive feel here. <laughs> well, I thank you all for listening. Uh, th this is where I stole these things from. It's uh, all from Google. Everything's publicly available. Thank you again, and I'm open to questions.